Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining this session on Brick Fundamentals. My name is Terry Klingspon. I am the architectural rep uh, for the Greater Toronto Area, and uh, I will be providing this uh, presentation today. Because it's recording, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, invite you to ask questions, but I do know that my uh, counterpart, uh, Mark Coot, should be available um, for that after the presentation is done. Now, this course was designed to be um, a continuing education uh, credit under AIA. Uh, we do not have, that I'm aware of, the same uh, ability for OAA, um, but it will count as a self-directed um, credit. And so if that's something you're interested in, uh, again, just contact Mark and he'll make sure that you get uh, a certificate that says you attended today. So upon uh, completing this, you should be able to, you know, achieve some basic things. Um, look at the clay brick uh, manufacturing uh, cycle and uh, the different characteristics of, of clay brick. Um, look at uh, CSA and ASTM standards and understand differences in those, uh, as well as some basic uh, wall system and um, installation patterns. So first we look at the manufacturing process. It hasn't changed a lot in, uh, in a lot of years. Um, a brick has largely stayed a brick. Mostly what's changed is, is the way that it gets fired and how um, quickly and efficiently and um, at, at what pace um, that can happen. So on the diagram, you can see the basics. So we start with the raw material. Now that's either clay or shale, uh, depending on the, the region and the deposit that you're working from. Uh, so that, uh, that raw material is mined. Uh, it goes through an original um, crushing stage which takes it down so that nothing's larger than about two inches in diameter um, and then set aside for a while. When it's closer to time for actual manufacturing, that raw material will be taken and put through uh, a grinding and a series of screens until it gets fine enough uh, to manufacture brick from. And the, uh, the grind at that point is going to have it Something, something close to the size and, and texture of, of beach sand. Um, so that will uh, be stored until, again, it's, it's brick making time. At that point, it's taken and putting into uh, a pug mill. Uh, pug mill is going to do a couple of things. It's going to ensure a good mix, and it's also going to measure uh, moisture content and make sure that's proper uh, through the rest of the process. Um, you want the uh, clay mixture to be moist enough that you can mold it the way you want to, um, but not so moist that it won't hold its uh, shape, especially under the weight of other brick uh, sitting on top of it. So that will happen once that mixing and uh, moisture content is, is proper. Uh, it will go through a vacuum chamber um, it's going to take the moisture out of the brick uh, to a point, uh, sorry, not the moisture, it's going to take any air pockets out of that mix, but we don't want that happening, right? So we're going to remove the, the air from the mix and then it will be, um, and then it will be uh, through the shaper cap. So we'll put it through the extruder. Um, at the uh, extruder stage, uh, that's when um, the length and the bed depth of the brick are formed, as well as the core holes. So all of that happens at, at one time. 
Um, the brick progresses down the line. Any texture or um, material that needs to be added to the face uh, will be added at that time. And then a, it's cut into slugs, and then the slugs are pushed through cutting wires. And depending how the cutting wires are spaced, that will determine the height of the brick. So from that point, uh, it moves along, um, gets loaded onto uh, kiln cars. Kiln car is going to go into the dryer uh, holding room, spend some time there, and then into the dryer where we're actually going to take that moisture content down um, very low to, to uh, I believe, less than 1%. And uh, that heat in the um, dryer is largely obtained just by runoff from the kiln. So when the kiln, uh, when the, the kiln reaches the stage where it needs to cool the brick off again before exiting, then that excess heat is taken and pumped into the dryer. So from the dryer, then into the kiln, uh, depending on the operation, the, some kilns move along a little quicker than others. But uh, we're probably close to a day uh, through the kiln and then out where the brick is uh, de-hacked from the car and um, goes through packaging and labeling. So the benefits of brick are, uh, are a great list, you know. Um, does not contain a lot of the VOCs or, or uh, nasty things that people are, are worried about. It doesn't burn. Uh, it's mold and insect resistant. Resists damage from flying debris. Got that 100 year plus life cycle. Uh, it can be salvaged and reused and is, you know, very often and really requires next to nothing once it's installed as far as um, maintenance or, or any additional finishes. So here's a, um, here is a listing of the usual sizes that we manufacture. So they, um, you know, progress from, from smaller to larger, and that's sort of what's happened um, along the way as far as um, the industry in general. So um, the um, my computer is giving me strange messages here. Uh, metric modular was the granddaddy. So that uh, that goes uh, as far back as uh, well, much farther than any of us can remember. And um, that is uh, most commonly done in the uh, half running bond, and you'll see more about that. A little while later, um, that because um, two headers and a joint equal the face of the brick. So um, metric modular uh, was uh, that, and then um, a little later on, progressed up to Ontario size. And Ontario size was the next uh, step in economy. This bricklaying is piecework, and um, you know the the less pieces you need to cover a wall. Theoretically, the less expensive it's going to be. So Ontario size came next, still maintained that same um, property of two headers and a joint equal a face, so half running bond. The next move was into CSR. Uh, again, that was largely a bid for economy in the wall. CSR was the end of the half running bond, or at least the end of a natural half running bond. So CSR and anything above that in size uh, works on the one third uh, running bond. Max size, that was the next step in, uh, in residential and it is still the most popular size uh, made for residential construction today. Uh, metric Norman, Engineer Norman and metric Jumbo um, all size is more specific to the ICI market.
So in specifying brick, uh, there are you know quite a few different aspects to it, but um, yeah. <laughs> The basics of the brick are going to be the width and the height and the length. Okay. I apologize for some of the pauses. I'm uh, I'm learning um, WebEx and recording um, as we go, and uh, having to take just a second to digest the messages as they come up. Uh, so CSA standards and how they differ from ASTM. So that's what we'll spend the next few minutes looking at. Um, CSA A82 is the one that we're most concerned with in, um, in Canada. And right now we're at A82-14 uh, is the, the latest. Facing brick. You'll see when we go through the American standards, um, all of their types of brick start with an FB for uh, facing brick. Um, we used to have that designation in, in CSA, and it's largely uh, disappeared at this point, and you'll see that as well. So for A82-14, uh, so you want to uh, specify that that's the standard that you work, that you want the uh, brick to uh, conform to. Uh, the you want to talk about the grade, so either exterior or interior. Um, anything that we're going to sell as a company will all be uh, exterior grade. And then the type, and the type has everything to do with uh, appearance and uh, the, the properties of the brick as far as tolerances in, in dimension. X being the most uh, stringent, S being your everyday brick, and A uh, being architectural tolerances. I always thought that was kind of an odd term in that um, when you think architectural, you think uh, very exacting, and in this case, it means quite the opposite. Uh, that brick type is kind of a no holds barred. So, if you want to specify uh, a brick that looks like a hockey stick, that's your that's your go to. ASTM C two sixteen. So that's the ASTM equivalent to A eighty two fourteen. Um, you will see some differences in that they still refer to uh, severe weather, which is the equivalent to our exterior grade, and moderate weather, which would be more akin to our interior grade. And you will see they have the same X, S, and A, but in their case, um, all three are preceded by an FB for facing brick. ASTM C652. So this is the main um, difference between ASTM and um, CSA, or one of the main differences, in that um, CSA does not include any, um, any standard for hollow brick. And that's basically what these products are. Our hollow brick, you will see down at the bottom under types, uh, the HB. And that in that midsection, there are actually two types of hollow, the 25 to 40% void and those that are above 40%. Um, but you will not find either of those in Canada. So it's just touching on uh, some of the main differences, uh, the durability test, the freeze thaw, if, uh, if the freeze-thaw testing is um, necessary or desired, um, that is a difference in that uh, the Canadian standard now uh, uses a no-dry test, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in a few minutes. 
Um, weather and grade, again, we, we addressed that, e.g. as opposed to the severe weather and the fact that we do not preface our brick types with the um, FB any longer. Another uh, key difference is in, uh, in just terminology or, or definitions. So for uh, CSA, for the A8214, um, solid means absolutely solid, no voids at all. And um, we use the terminology of cord for anything that has voids or core holes, which represent up to the 25% of the total. Um, we do not have terminology uh, under our standard for, for the hollow. And um, under the ASTM, uh, a solid means anything with cores up to 25% of the total. And then um, as we've, uh, we've already seen before, um, above 25% would be considered uh, a hollow brick or fall under C652. Uh, the other uh, differences that appear between CSA and ASTM are some of the finer points. Um, at one point years and years ago, there was a more distinct uh, difference, but at this point now, um, the differences are, are quite small, except for the um, <clears throat> cord or solid versus hollow. So when, they, um, when we look at the uh, five-hour boiling water absorption, um, when you're looking at CSA, um, all of the five individual brick tested need to come in at less than 17%. And uh, under ASTM, um, an individual brick within a group of five can actually um, be higher than that as long as it's less than 20, and provided the average of the five comes in at uh, under 17. Same with 24-hour uh, cold water absorption uh, and the um, CV ratio. So, you know, uh, under CSA, cold water needs to be less than 8%. CV ratio needs to be less than 0.78. Under ASTM, uh, higher... Uh, higher individual results are allowed as long as the um, average comes within the spec. So we'll just show some uh, some actual you know uh, picture examples of the differences between the standards that we're talking about. So A82 and C216 would be uh, in the picture on your left. And then the uh, C652 would be better represented by the picture on the right. And the um, uh, differences in them being the uh, percentage of the brick, which is uh, void, and the uh, thicknesses of the, uh, of the webbing and the, and the distance between the core holes and the face. So again, just referring to the um, difference in terminology, uh, cord versus the solid. And again here. So uh, under CSA A82, the only thing that would qualify as solid is the brick pictured in the top left, the brick pictured bottom left, uh, as long as the uh, voids that are less than 25% would be acceptable and referred to as cord. Uh, currently under CSA, there is no provision for any of the brick on the right side of this page. So again, 
under CSA, um, the voids always have to be less than 25%. And under ASTM, the hollow brick, um, there's certainly provision for them to be uh, more extensive the voids. Here's some more uh, particular examples of what that would mean. So under A82 or C216, uh, you're going to see that distance between the outer surface of the brick and the core hole be no less than three quarters of an inch. And under the C652, you're going to see that uh, distance between the, the void and the outer surface uh, is allowed to be five eighths. And actually the webs within the brick could be uh, as little as half an inch. Just a depiction again of, of the uh, different variations. So just to review again, uh, CSA 82 and the um, ASTM C216 and C652. And here's an example of um, the difference in terminologies between severe weather, moderate weather, negligible weather, and uh, the requirement for exterior grade. Uh, so this uh, portion that you see out in the, the western part of the country or, um, you know, down around uh, Ontario and Quebec, so anywhere that yellow is, is uh, considered severe weather, not because of the fact that it's uh, colder than anywhere else, but because of the amount of times we travel back and forth between freezing and thawing. So uh, somewhere that uh, gets extremely cold and stays that way is actually going to be, you know, considered negligible weathering as opposed to severe. So it's because of our patterns of freezing and thawing that we need to meet that severe weather or exterior grade. So some of the things that are uh, addressed uh, in the standard are compressive strength, the initial rate of absorption, a uh, 24 hour cold and a five hour boil, the uh, saturation coefficient or the CB ratio and the uh, freeze thaw testing. Compressive strength um, is one that uh, we always do so we can make sure that we uh, comply with the standard, but um, is one that is of probably the least concern in that um, brick as we uh, deal with it is a, is a veneer. Um, it is not a load bearing product and the compressive strength results come out far, far higher than anything that uh, CSA or ASTM calls for. Initial rate of absorption. So um, this one, um, we don't deal with as much, but it can be, it can be significant. And um, this is going to be something more that um, a mason is, is going to be concerned with. So, you know, when that initial rate of absorption um, is too high, then um, that is a situation where um, the mason is not going to have time that he wants to uh, to work with the brick and so may even consider in extreme cases um, wetting them uh, to slow that uh, slow that process down. Uh, 
Likewise, if the initial rate of absorption is too low, which is the case with a lot of um, very hard fired bricks that come up from the US, uh, then the uh, brick can be harder for the mason to work with, can take longer to set in the wall, can have danger of floating. Um, if the uh, if the mason tries to move too quickly, so that can be an important aspect in those ways. So when they're um, looking at absorption rates and um, coming up with the uh, eventual CB ratio. Um, so the brick is, is first uh, put into a 24-hour um, cold water absorption. And um, that, that uh, rate of absorption is, is measured. And then that same brick is taken and um, put in boiling water for five hours to see just how much more water can be forced into uh, the brick. And um, that is to um, sort of represent the uh, expansion of, of uh, freezing thawing water that could take place um, during the, the winter months. So those results, the 24 hour cold water absorption and the five hour boil are um, used in formula to come up with a CB ratio. Now the CB ratio has to be less than 0.78. However, if um, none of the brick uh, in the five being used for the test um, exceeded an 8% cold water, then you're allowed to um, bypass the CB ratio uh, requirement. A freeze thaw. So, uh, given that some of the brick exceeded eight percent, and uh, given that it it was deemed necessary to to go through a, a freeze thaw testing. Then um, that happens as, as 50 cycles. And as we referred to before, um, that has become more severe uh, for the uh, Canadian standard in the last few years. So at one point, you would go through the 20-hour um, freeze and the four-hour thaw, and uh, you'd sort of get to the weekend, and the brick would get to take a little rest. So they would let that dry um, and then start again on um, Monday when everybody came back to work. And that doesn't happen any longer as far as the CSA uh, standards are concerned. We use a, a no dry, so it would just stay um, in the freezer over the weekend, come in on Monday and start the process again. So 50 cycles and if through all of that, the brick um, was able to withstand and um, lose less than um, an undesirable amount of mass, then you're allowed to uh, presume that that meets exterior grade. Um, I can't speak for the industry as a whole, but as far as Meridian Brick is concerned, um, anything that we actually send to freeze thaw, we do so for education purposes. And it's not likely that that's going to find its way um, out to any customer on, on any site. Efflorescence, um, again, just, uh, just for information's sake, um, you know, there's basically a, a wicking test, as you can see. And um, it's just to test and see if there are soluble uh, salts in the brick itself. So if the brick gets uh, put into the water and there's efflorescence uh, visible, then that is recorded. Um, and if not, will not be. But normally the salts uh, show up from other materials such as uh, the mortar. So just to revisit to the um, different specifications. 
So you've got your type A, your type S, and your type X. Just wanted to mention at this point too that um, you know Canada does not have at this point that I'm aware a um, standard which pertains uh, directly to thin brick, but that will be coming. Um, thin brick is becoming more and more popular all the time under ASTM. The same way as you have um, FB for facing brick and um, HB for hollow brick, they also have um, they also have classifications which would um, be TBA, TBS, TBX. Uh, means all the same things as far as appearance and um, tolerances. It's just that it applies to thin brick instead of face brick. Some of the other things addressed in the standard, chippage, size, distortion. So depending again on um, which type of brick is selected, um, there can be um, greater or lesser uh, tolerances for chippage and for any other imperfections um, in the, the uh, appearance of the brick. And the same thing applies to tolerances as far as variations in size. So length, height, width, all of those defined. And uh, again, S will have a, a lesser less stringent uh, requirement, and type X will have the most stringent. That will apply as well for warpage, distortion, out of square. So the standard does allow for some imperfections. You've seen before uh, on the earlier slide that um, it did address um, chippage. Um, it also uh, addresses cracks. And one rule of thumb um, is that for a type S, it, uh, it requires that they not be vi uh, visible um, from a distance of six meters or, or 20 feet. Uh, for type X, that distance would be less. So four and a half meters or 15 feet. So to summarize, uh, if you're going to um, specify properly a, a brick in Canada or the US, um, so you're going to start with um, CSA in Canada, or ASTM in the United States. And then refer to the um, standards of choice. So in Canada, that's always gonna be A82. Um, in dealing with an American product, um, C216 uh, is really the only one that's gonna apply north of the border. And then the brick type, again, for residential, uh, type S or FBS under ASTM. And uh, for ICI applications, it's more likely going to be an X or an FBX. And again, exterior grade, or in the US, um, severe weather. If you uh, have specified all of those things, um, all that's left is your manufacturer of choice. Uh, again, the size and the color. And if you've uh, specified all of those things, you're pretty sure to get what it was you desire.
So we already talked about quite a few of the benefits of, of brick construction, but the fact that um, most brick is installed, you know, using a cavity wall or, or rain screen type of uh, application means that it's extremely effective. So it does all of the things that it needs to do very, very well. Um, really, really slows down the heat transfer um, and it uh, protects from the elements, protects from uh, breakage and uh, just a great long lasting wall detail. Again, impact resistance, fire resistance, when they're um, talking about fire resistance and they refer to um, an equivalent thickness, equivalent thickness really is the um, bed depth of the brick. So uh, in the case of max, three and a half inches um, times the percentage of uh, the brick that is solid. So if we have, you know, 25% 20, uh, voids, and the brick is 75% solid, then you take that three and a half inches times 0.75, and that will give you your um, equivalent thickness. So a little on bond patterns. Uh, stretcher, and stretcher is obviously the one that, that we see the very most. Header would be probably the next most common, uh, although you won't usually see a header used as a full brick like that. Usually they'll use uh, cut brick for that purpose. Any of the other applications that you see here have the potential to show the core holes um, unless you're using a brick that is solid. Um, so roll lock. Rolock Stretcher, Soldier, and uh, Sailor, all of those have the potential to uh, have core holes visible and so are used much less often. However, sure as I say that, there's a picture of a building that's used from the, almost every single one, I believe, as well as a, a Flemish Bond. So this one, uh, this one took a great deal of attention to, to put together. We don't see that a whole lot. Here are some of your most common. So the running bond, and like I said, uh, for older bricks, um, half running bond for the newer sizes, uh, one third running bond. Probably the next most common that we see these days is stack bond. And um, most of these others are, um, find their application more in renovation type work. Just a quick review. Uh, our product is made from clay or shale. Uh, does not contain uh, toxic materials. Um, you know, mostly uh, mostly the raw material is um, is surface mined, and uh, after the mines are are uh, finished, their usefulness are returned to completely natural uses. Um, parks. You know, um, ponds, subdivisions, uh, schoolyards, um, anything. So, um, brick is a great product that way. We talked about CSA and ASTM and the differences between those. Talked a little bit about um, drainage and wall systems and how effective brick is that way. The impact and the fire resistance of of masonry and some common terminology.
So I hope this has been uh, interesting. I hope it has been somewhat useful. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. Again, uh, my name is Terry. Um, it was a pleasure uh, doing this for you. And I will end the presentation at this point and um, turn things over to Mr. Coot. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Well, thank you for attending our presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Mark Koo. I'm Senior Account Manager for Eastern Canada, which basically consists of everything east of uh, Kingston to the Maritimes. At this point, I'll open the floor for any questions. On the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A chat there. Uh, you can just click into your if you have any specific questions and I'll see if I can answer them. No questions so far, so we'll just wait a few more seconds to see if anything comes in. We have a question here, are glazed brick common? Uh, yes, well, glazed brick we've, it's starting to come back a bit more, especially in the commercial side of it. Uh, there's not that many manufacturers that do make some. They're basically, there's probably like two or three of them in the United States. Uh, it's limited production, and, and but I know it seems to be growing back again in specific uh, architectural applications. Wait a few more seconds, see if any other questions arrive. Nothing else. Uh, if you want to have the confirmation of your attendance to this presentation, uh, you can reach out either to myself uh, I can give you my email address, which is mark.coot, K-O-O-T, at meridianbrick.ca, or contact somebody at Berkeley, and they will bounce that to me, and we'll get you that uh, uh, attendee certification. Doesn't look like there's any other questions at this point, so thank you again for attending this presentation. And if there's anything, you can always uh, contact us. Thank you.